Andrew Knight and uh, welcome to this uh, next episode of the uh, RICS Tech Partner Program. Um, I've been with RICS now for uh, over 10 years uh, and I sit in the standards regulatory and thought leadership part of the organization and my role is to look at the uh, the effects uh, of data and technology right across the built and natural environment with over 130,000 members working worldwide uh, right across the property cycle across rural, agricultural, residential, commercial infrastructure. Um, there's a huge canvas upon which data and technology is bringing benefits to the sector. And today, I'm really glad again to have a conversation with Thomas McAlpine from Adland. So uh, Thomas, do join me again. Hi, Andrew. It's good to be back. Yeah, welcome again and, and, and good to chat again. And we had a fascinating uh, conversation last time, I know, where we talked about uh, your backstory, particularly in terms of, uh, of land due diligence. I think you did rather rudely call it the Wild West at some point, but it was certainly, I think, as you mentioned. I may have, may yeah. have mentioned that. <laughs> but it was certainly a, a really interesting backstory you had in terms of your particular skill set. And I know you mentioned the, the kind of technology uh, skills you have across the team. Uh, and I think it's an interesting uh, point to make once again, as I often do in these conversations, the power of combining domain specific knowledge about land and property with that technical know-how because obviously there are a number of challenges about how you bring together the data sets and present the technology but um, I really wanted to start with with a question about productivity because there's ultimately technology is not here for technology's sake it's about productivity and it'd be just really good to hear again your view on how your kind of platform brings productivity gains because you lived and breathed this issue you lived and breathed the the the, the, the challenges of bringing together lots of data sets for that kind of due diligence purpose so please do bring that alive for us thomas of course thanks andrew i um i i mentioned in the last session you know my, my background was as a land promoter i'd be having to do all this due diligence on sites and you know a developer has to do the same uh, a survey has to go out and, and do uh, surveys of sites and the, the solutions that were out there just meant that you had to do it really manually. You'd have to go and go off to uh, Historic England's website and DEFRA's and you know Natural England, and it, it could take forever to actually just do what was quite basic due diligence on a piece of land. So Adland, in our mission to build this single destination, on, and, uh, on one side it's that marketplace we mentioned last time, on the other side it's the professional tools, um, which buyers and sellers of land and also land professionals need to be able to do the correct due diligence on land uh, and bring those all into one place and, and in the process making it visible and accessible to all and that's that's really where you know what we try to do with ad land professional was get those productivity gains by making it really accessible so that anybody could use it and, and accessibility is also um, it's not just usability it's also affordability mm -hmm. so you know adland is a, as a solution is priced to the point where absolutely anyone can afford it any business i mean we're, we're talking uh compared to compared to some of our other options that are out there of 75 percent less and the reason we can do that um is because of our marketplace side uh, we can afford to, we can afford to make the software uh at a lower price point without actually sacrificing very much of the overall functionality um, and affordability is something that's been huge because you know there are you know there are people out there who who have been charging a lot more for these types of products. But luckily, I think for for the market, for for yourselves and for for large large businesses, for SMEs, um, the price point has come down over the last few years as new players have entered the market. Um, yeah, I mean, Thomas, that, that, that's sorry to interrupt, but that that's a key yeah, point. Of and I always sort of slightly. Um, um, remind all our tech partners about this issue that the, the, the fact that so much of the profession like other professions whether you're talking about architects or or lawyers the majority of the profession sit in these smaller practices that, that these oh, SMEs yeah. and uh, I'm sure you and I both have discussed this in the past that obviously that the larger surveying firms you know often have a lot of this expertise in-house they could they're able to go to these data sources themselves but it's also critical for us that our SMEs have this ability to access technology oh. and you've mentioned the price point which is a, a good thing to hear in in terms of that and I guess it's an obvious comment to make but this is software as a service so this is something that effectively people can simply log on to it's priced in an accessible way and I guess as we'll see in a few minutes from a, a kind of ease of use perspective yes you need to be a specialist in terms of land and property but this is not a tech product in terms of that kind of interface is it no it's 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 not it, it's 
it's something that in, when you start using the platform and we gave or you showed sort of a, a quick demo in the last session it's it's just it's very intuitive the layout's very there's no distractions you can get right to the data you really want very quickly and it and it's interesting you, you mentioned the smes you know we really did build it with smes in mind as well it's not just for the for the huge agents and the huge property developers because as you say they often have either in their own internal technology um, some mapping solution um, we find some with some of the really big agents, they have their own internal mapping, but then they still come to us because they're using our marketplace side to sell land. They still come to us and want to use our tools because, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, we are a tech company and that's what we're good at. And our, you know, team Adland is very fortunate that we've attracted some seriously good talent um, from across the prop tech and wider technology industry over the last year. Um, but that's what we do. Um, and so we always say these developers and agents who are using their internal stuff, you know, we won't go and try and sell any, sell any land or build any homes. And we'll just keep providing robust and robust and accessible data. Um, so for SMEs, it's brilliant because Adland as a single destination allows them to do everything themselves really easily. And as you say, at that affordable price point. So they can come onto Adland and know that they're getting robust, reliable data. It's updated regularly at the frequency it needs to be. Um, and it's all in a in clean, intuitive interface that makes the land visible and accessible. That's great. I mean, it's probably worth uh, us uh, in a few seconds looking at the platform itself, because another area that I'm interested in, as well as that kind of due diligence, is, is, is more the kind of brokerage side in terms of what land agents can do with it as well. So maybe you could show us that kind of dare I say use the word brokerage but that that view from that kind of more, more sort of transactional of, of course view. yeah we 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 call it the market the marketplace side so it's it's the it's the this was as we mentioned at the beginning of session one there was there were two sides to add land and there were two problems we wanted to solve one was yes providing all this data um, for buyers and for sellers and also for professionals who may or may not be buying or selling land and just doing it as their day-to-day -day job like surveyors um, but on the other side it was trying to give buyers and sellers this really great experience where they could go to one single destination and actually be able to find just land or as we as I'll show we also do houses with land as well yeah so let me uh, uh, show the application here so this is our home page right now so you can see um, the latest picks that have come onto the website in each region yeah. Um, you can see the different main categories of land, so agricultural, which is mainly farms, development, uh, rural, which is things like woodlands and equestrian yeah. properties, grazing, etc. And then we have our residential homes category as well. Um, we'll go in and we'll look, say, in Oxfordshire. And you'll be able to see, um, we won't select any, pre-select any land types, we'll just see all of them. Okay. And you'll be able to see all of the properties that we currently have just in Oxfordshire. So you can see all of these icons, it's a split view, um, and you can see all of the properties currently in Oxfordshire. You can increase that range as well. So you could say add 25 meters, uh, 25 miles, sorry, to the radius. Um, and the iconography here, you can quickly spot what's a farm, what's development, what's yeah. rural. And one of the key things that we do um, on Adland is we, one of our USPs is that we show, as you can see there, the exact property boundary. So whether that be made up of one title or yeah. five titles grouped together or part of two titles, we show the exact. So the buyer knows exactly what they are buying um, and the seller can really easily show that buyer without having to answer a million questions about can you send me a plan for this and a site map and things. It's already so there. So you'll effectively merge the polygons into, into one uh, exactly boundary, exactly yeah. and that's and it's the polygons that data that we get actually from hm land registry and then we then take that and create our own functionality of how to use them and customize them um, that enables this all of all of this to work and on the other side here so all of these listings here are represented in the list view over here so you can see listings from knight frank strutton parker um, you can load more as well and you can also filter out so if you only want to see um say uh a residential you want to see country estates country homes and you want to see bare land equestrian recreational woodland so basically all of our rural and residential categories you save that and you search again you'll notice all of the red uh, mm. agricultural and the purple development uh, sites will disappear and you'll be left with these ones and you can see the list has updated to reflect that um, so this is I and, and of course you go in here you can click on uh, one of these this is on with uh, one of our agents, Fisher German, um, and then you can click on there and you get um, the what we call the listing detail page yeah. where someone can easily book a viewing, get in touch with the agent, find out um, all the information they need to know 
about the piece of land. And at the end, we also reiterate that that is a, the property boundary. That's exactly yeah. what's being sold. So it's not always, especially if you're selling a large farm, it's not always the entire farm. It could just be some part of the farm um, it's sold in lots normally. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the marketplace experience. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it's been interesting, obviously, that, that you've highlighted uh, an area that often <clears throat> I think can get forgotten in conversations around the whole rural land use and rural land types. And uh, obviously, with, with emerging issues around biodiversity, phosphates, nitrates, etc., what sort of things uh, do you either support now or you can see coming into the platform to support that kind of that those issues around rural land use? Great question. Um, on in the in the last session, I gave a quick demo of Adland Professional, hmm. um, and you might have some eagle-eyed people might have seen <laughs> that there was some layers that said coming soon. One of those is nitrate vulnerable zones, and the other is environmental stewardship scheme. So, in uh, things like nitrates and phosphates um, are an issue at the moment, um, and it's a lot of the land being sold. Well, the credits for the nitrate mm -hmm. credits will actually be worth sometimes more than the land itself being sold. Um, and so I think surveyors have to be really aware of where whether the land sits in one of these vulnerable zones or not. Um, and in, when it comes to rural land, environmental stewardship schemes as well, whether or not a piece of land has is part of a scheme, at what level of the scheme it is, when it's going to expire. Um, so all of that information, these are layers we're going to be bringing in really soon. Um, another part that's really when it comes to talking about uh, rural product that's actually going to massively affect developers next year is the um, environment bill has just been passed into law um, as of a couple of weeks ago and the environment bill along with a host of other features um, is aimed at increasing biodiversity and biodiversity what they call biodiversity net gain credits bng credits for short are going to become a huge industry in the uk because what it effectively says is is that if you have a site um down you know let's say a site here in oxfordshire and, and you are going to be bulldozing some green space and building 100 homes and you get an environmental survey to come along and say okay well the biodiversity was say 50 credits before you're going to take away 40 of those credits. Um, mm. You then, by the end of the development, have to show a 10% gain. So you have to be back up at 55 by the time the development's finished. That means you've got a deficit of 45 credits. And now you can make on-site provision to restore some of that biodiversity, yeah. but odds are you're gonna have to look within the local authority um, to buy credits from somewhere else and offset the impact you've had on biodiversity. And the way that's done is by people who own farms, people who own country estates mm -hmm. and large property holdings can set aside some of their land for this, this uh, buzzword that everyone uses now called for real rewilding. And yeah. they can work with the local authority to introduce a covenant on the land that will say, we won't touch it for 10 or 20 or 30 yeah. years. Um, and it's you know, ec therefore worth X amount of credits, which they can go off and sell. So we will start seeing, I mean, we are, we are going to be having biodiversity net gain credits on ad land because they're effectively just a type of land listing. Yeah. So you know, our land listings are up for sale or up for option or up for promotion. Um, land listings can also be just for, you know, the credits being sold on that piece of land. But that's going to become a huge business for, for developers. Surveyors will need to know about those and how they work um, and what the impact that a development's having as well. So very much like the current carbon offset market, where there's going to be a huge need for yeah. trans, you know, participants on both sides to be to be made available of where those offsets exist. Yeah. And obviously and it's, additional uh, covenants on land that, that, that people will need to see as part of their conditionality when they're looking at future work as well. Yeah, well, to, to meet the requirements of the of the Environment Act, yeah, it, whether it be rural or for development, whether you're a RICS surveyor working for a rural agent or you're working for a property developer, you will need to know about these. Mm. No, obviously a, a huge implication and once again a need for data to support all the participants that are going to need to manage that process uh, talking about I suppose, another interesting sort of set of participants here is is the whole area of local authorities and, and local plans how do you see the potential of the platform to support that because clearly there's such an impetus now for these local plans to be developed and executed and, and to work with the various stakeholders and clearly a lot of these will have huge demands on on local land use it, it comes back to um, the affordability point. We we really want to work with local authorities. There was a there was a white paper written by Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government, which has since been renamed, uh, with the new Secretary of State took over, um, 
but last year, around about August, they released a white paper that stated that uh, the the public sector is looking to work with the prop tech sector um, mm -hmm. in order to deliver uh, value add gains um, in and around, especially the planning policy process. Um, back when I was a promoter, you know, I'd often be looking at 400 page local plan, joint core strategy documents mm -hmm. uh, for various local authorities, having to comb through those, looking at five year housing land supply documents um, to understand, you know, what sites have been allocated, where they were in their housing position delivery targets for that period and that local authority. Um, and a lot of that's all still very, very manual. Um, and we would love to work with local authority and we are parts of uh, various uh, test test programs mm. um, working with working with public sector to see how we can bring to bear our technology um, into the planning policy process. And that could be looking at helping a local authority being able to collect information to produce uh, a SHLA, a Strategic Housing mm. Land Availability Assessment, um, to be able to allocate sites, being able to handle the initial consultation process with the public sector, um, so uh, well, with the, with the public, um, and then being able to sort of go through a, a process where at the end you're looking at producing a map of allocated sites. Well, obviously, huge potential there, given given the scale. Uh, I mean, are there any other, in terms of your kind of medium to longer term roadmap, are there other data sources that you'd you'd like to get your hands on, if I can use that expression? Yeah, I, 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 there's two sides to the to, to our data um, and how we want to develop our, our data plan. Is one is bringing in more and more data layers that our users want. Where we uh, bring in a big part of what we do, like any technology company, um, is. We constantly are chatting through our customer mm -hmm. success function. We're constantly talking to our customers um, and finding out what are they liking, what are they not liking, what can they, what what else do they need? Um, and so we are constantly going through an iteration process. Um, and you know, one of the things we're hearing right now is developers are wanting to understand where infrastructure requirements are, so mm -hmm. where um, substations are, where pa buried power lines are, uh, what's the capacity of the grid in this area. Um, Contaminated land um, can can affect uh, development. So you know, historic contaminated land, current landfills, things like that. Um, people want to understand traffic, whether that be foot or vehicle, yeah. um, when they're thinking about building a new development somewhere. So all of those types of uh, data sets we want to bring in. On the other side is what can we do that is only data we can provide? Um, yeah, because that makes us what we call in the industry sticky. Yeah. And part of that, which I think I mentioned on the last session, is in and around the, the side of the, of the platform, our business that you've just seen, the marketplace, for example, the traffic, half a million people we've had visit the site in the last six months. Um, and that's growing almost exponentially. Um, every time they come to site, they, they do searches. We know what they're searching for. Um, it's all anonymized, of course, but we yeah. know the number of people searching in this area for this type of land. Um, and when properties are sold, we know how long it was on the market for, we know where it was, we know how much it sold for. So those two different types of data we can actually bring together um, onto the research side, which I gave a demo of last time. Yeah. Um, and we can start showing, say for example, the search data, we can start showing heat maps of what where market demand is. Um, in the country at the moment, not just you know as, as on a macro scale, but down on a micro scale in the last 24 hours even, what have people been searching for? Mm. Um, and when it comes to um, the the knowing what where a piece of land was sold and what it was sold for, um, we can also start producing um, land comparables information as well. So yeah. I, I don't think I did it in the last session, but you know we take the land registry data and we show it as dots on the map. But generally that's quite focused on urban areas. Yeah. And there is no one place that you can go and get land prices and land comparables. Um, it just there, there is because there is no place to do that historically. <laughs> so what we want to do is start to build up a data set that is uh, definitive of ad land. And that goes back to why it's all one single destination and why we needed to bring both sides together to make ad land work. Indeed, indeed. I mean, have you had any, had any thoughts about linking? Uh, you've talked about obviously your sort of almost proprietary value add in terms of that marketplace data, but I've seen systems before uh, looking at sort of development and, and, and bringing in some kind of 
econometrics in terms of employment levels and, and things like that because obviously when people are looking at developments they're also sometimes thinking of the economic health of areas have, have you thought about adding those kind of metrics in yeah well? i i think i think you know the way that planning is trying to go and obviously mhclg had had some setbacks uh, earlier this year and you know that they had plans to hmm. sort of reform the planning process but i think where it will end up is people are really thinking about uh the built environment a lot more spaces and the planning of space and a lot of that as you say is also thinking about the sort of the socio-economic benefits that can be brought by new developments um so that sort of data is data that we would love to be able to provide through the platform the question is is always is is how do we make sure it's reliable and robust yeah um because that's where our value add is and it's our job to find that data clean it and bring it onto the site um, in an easy to use format. So we will yeah. be abs absolutely looking to bring in other data around social uh, data sets, around economic data sets uh, and environmental data sets that can give more color to people who are yeah. either in the development world, in the surveying world, in the valuations world, conveyancing world um, and the planning world. Yeah, but as you say, you know, it's key that it's trusted data. It's it's key that it comes from a you know accreditable source and that people have that absolutely. transparency, isn't it? So uh, Ab -abs really absolutely, and and you know when we're developing out new products, we go through incredible amounts of testing before anything hits the the live site, um, because it's we need we need our customers to trust that they can rely on the data that we're providing. Yeah, no, there's always that danger in the digital world that just because it pops up on the screen, people assume that it's correct. When, as you say, there's a lot of hard work to make sure that you verify it and, and make sure it's accurate and that it comes from a trusted source. So. Well, I think I think we've all been around the internet long enough to know you can't believe everything you see. But hopefully, <laughs> yeah. with Adland, uh, when when our professionals and and even non-professionals, people buying country houses, come on and use yeah. the platform, they can trust in the data. Good. Well, it's been fascinating to talk once again, uh, and I really look up, uh, look forward to catching up next year, particularly with these developments around local plans and that di biodiversity piece, which, which does feel huge in a good way, as in terms of the impact on the environment, but clearly a, a huge impact on the way people manage and acquire land. So uh, I look forward to chatting again in the near future, Thomas. Me too, Andrew. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure.